youth sung the other night at youth singing Sunday evening. It brought back a lot of memories because it was a song that we sang at camp. Um, and I was hoping that it was in this blue book, and it is, but it is missing the very last verse. So if you turn to number 51 in the blue book, um, it's called Heavenly Melodies. I know it's probably not a very good offering song, but I, I really enjoy it. So um, it goes through one, two, three, four, five, six different songs. So we're going to be switching songs. I told them Sunday night about the time they recognize the song, we're going to switch. Um, and then at the very end, it says, But until the day my heart will go on singing, until then, with joy I'll carry on, until the day my eyes behold the city, until the day God calls me home. And that's where this one ends. But at camp we always sang a verse of home, sweet home afterwards. So we're going to try this. I don't know, if you look down through there, if you recognize the song, feel free to help as much as you can. Let's talk about Jesus, the King of kings is he, the Lord of lords supreme throughout eternity, the great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Isn't he wonderful? Good morning. good morning. It is good to be here this morning. I've been very encouraged. I love that song that we just sang. Uh, just a lot of good words in that song. Talks about how Jesus is wonderful. Do we believe that this morning? Is Jesus truly wonderful to you this morning? Are we rejoicing this morning? Are we rejoicing in Christ? It talked about heaven. It talked about heaven being a wonderful place. You know, Jesus promised that he is going to go and he's going to prepare a place for us. Do we believe that this morning? 
He also promised that one day he was going to return. Are we ready for that reunion? Are we ready and prepared this morning for when that day comes? I want to welcome each one this morning to the further service. It is good to have each one of you here this morning. I trust that you've had a, a good week. So I, I really appreciated the devotional that Brother Joel shared this morning. Talked about being in, you know, do we, do we spend time in the presence of God? And does our life reflect that? I think of, you know, the story of Moses as, as Joel shared that story of Moses going up there and, and spending time in the presence of God. And his life showed that. His face showed that. It radiated the glory of God. You know, and as, as we are, you know, in our, in our time that we have, it's as I shared before, you know, when, when we surrender our life to Jesus Christ, and we walk with him in obedience. He tells us there in, in uh, the Gospel of John, he says that he is going to come, him and his Father, and they're going to make their abode within us. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, we can experience the presence of God in our life every day. Does our life show that? Does our faith show that? And it's as Brother Joel shared, we have to be connected to the source. Because the, the, the light itself will never, it's, it's useless unless it has, it's connected to the source of power. I really appreciated that. Uh, I'm going to read a chapter here in Psalm, Psalm 90, if you want to turn to that. It's just, uh, it, it talks about our life, how short our life is uh, it's got a lot of good words in it it's it's a it's a prayer of Moses and it says here verse 1 it says Lord thou has been our dwelling place in all generations is God this morning is he our dwelling place are we dwelling with God Verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So before even the world was created, before anything was created, before man was created, he says, thou art God. Verse 3, thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past and as a watch in the night. When I think about that and I think about you know, the characteristics of God, and I think about how that a thousand years in the sight of God is but as of yesterday. It's just as a day. It's almost uncomprehendable when we think about that it says it's as it's as a watch in the night verse 5 thou carriest them away as with a flood they are as as a sleep and in the morning they are like grass which groweth up in the morning it flourishes and groweth up in the evening it is cut down and withereth verse 7 for we are consumed by thy anger and by thy wrath we are troubled thou hast set our iniquities before thee and our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. God knows each intricate detail of our life. He knows all of our iniquities. It's like he says, all of our iniquities are open before him. It says even our secret sins are exposed in the light of his countenance. God is light, and darkness cannot abide in the light. Verse 9, for all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our year are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet it is their strength, labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. It says we spend our years as a tale that is told. And as I think of that here, it was a week or two ago, we 
we were talking about how our life is wrote like an epistle. It's wrote like a, a book. And I shared a couple weeks ago if, if you know, there's, there's times where there's parts of our book that we would like to just tear out and throw the pages away. But we, we read the story or the epistles that Paul wrote, and there were, I'm sure there were parts in those that he was, he wanted to probably eliminate. But if my desire is, as I, as I walk my Christian walk, as I walk my Christian life, that when I die, that my epistle, the story that is told, what I want people to see as they read that book is that they see a life that is filled with sanctification by Jesus Christ. So it's verse 11, it says, Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. It talks about teaching us to number our days so that we can really focus on the things that are important because we don't have a lot of time. None of us who are here this morning, we don't know how much time we have. So do we take time to really to teach ourselves to number our days and to recognize that the things that we do for Christ is what's going to last. Verse 13, Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we, we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. It talks about rejoicing. Do we rejoice in the Lord? Verse 16, let thy work appear unto, the, unto thy servants and thy glory unto the, their children. And let the beauty of our Lord, of the Lord our God, be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. Do, do our lives... Do they reflect the beauty of the Lord? Do they reflect me being in the presence of God? That is my desire. That people may see my life and that they can see the reflection of Jesus Christ. I'd like to hear, before we turn the time over to Brother Felix, I'd like to, uh, maybe if we all stand and sing 124 in the blue books. <laughs> Unto thee, O Lord. First verse is, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Next one is, Show me thy ways. Thy ways, O Lord. Is that our heart this morning? Is that our prayer that we cry out to the Lord and we ask him, show me thy ways? Are we open to instruction? The second verse, it says, teach me thy paths. Are we being teachable? Are we allowing him to teach us? Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul? Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul?
Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, we come before you, Lord, with thankful hearts for your mercy, for your love. We've gathered together this morning to bless you, Lord, for your goodness and for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings in our life. We just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this way. Just pray, Father, that you would be with each one that is here. Pray, Lord, that you would have each one, Lord, have their hearts prepared for your word. Just pray, Lord, for our brother this morning. Pray that you would just anoint his lips. Pray that you would give him strength, give him clarity of mind, Lord, and just use him, Lord, to further your kingdom. Just pray all this in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Well, good morning. good to be in the house of God again this morning. I want to welcome each one of you here and welcome our visitors. And as we look to the Lord this morning for a message, I just want to, I guess, share that it was a bit of a struggle to even decide on what to, what to share. Um, had an extremely busy week. And uh, so it's kind of a, the way it goes when you're a bivocational preacher and you have to sort of switch gears at the end of the week and get a message ready. And I settled on a continuation of the last message that we shared and uh, I felt like I sort of left a lot of things unsaid that I, I felt were, were necessary. And um, if you remember, the last message we shared was on uh, purity and courtship. And I wanted to revisit the subject, I, or finish the subject. And so the, the, the title, if you, have a, if you want a title this morning, would be this, purity and courtship, why does it matter? Why is it, why is it important? And I want to turn to two Old Testament passages and draw some, draw some points, some conclusions from them. And we also want to, the, the, the two passages we're going to look at are, the first one is going to be in Genesis 34, if you want to start turning there. And... I think before we get into the message too much, I want to just preface it. I noticed in the song that we sang, Remember Not the Sins of My Youth. And I think many of us that are in our middle age years, 
have a lot of, of regrets. We have things we remember in the past that we're not proud of. And so if you want to think of young people, if you want to think of why this is important, it's that those of us who are middle-aged, uh, we, we just see so many things that could be avoided. We see so much unnecessary pain that could be not in your life. And so many things you would not have to deal with if you take heed, if you pay attention, if you look at what God has laid out. I think so much of, of what happens today is the result of deception, and or it's all sin is the result of deception. And Satan, along with the fallen culture of our day, has painted such a, an enticing picture when it comes to the area of sexual sin that it becomes irresistible to young people and to older people, but especially the young. And I, I believe one of the reasons that Satan so viciously attacks the young with this thing of sexual sin is he knows that if he can get young people ensnared and entangled and enmeshed in sexual sin, then he will thwart the purposes that God has for their life and the blessing that could result from that. And I am saying that, and I emphasize it the last time I preached, the grace of God and the forgiveness of God is real, and it's available to all of us, and it doesn't change. And we're so thankful for that. But at the same time, the point remains. There is no need for you to go into this and to suffer the damages and carry the scars and the regrets the rest of your life. Because while grace and forgiveness is available, the regret is still there and the scars remain. Okay? I think anybody that has um, experienced serious failure will, will tell you that. Be, your, be their testimony. So let's look at Genesis 34. It's a very, um, I think, instructive passage. I forgot to turn there while I was. One other thing I wanted to give, especially to young men, as a kind of an illustration in the, in the, the area of sexual sin. When I, was, uh, when I was a boy working at home on, on our farm, we had a dairy farm, and we had a big Holstein bull. And this guy was huge and dangerous and unmanageable. And so to make him more manageable, my dad got him into the corral and we put him in the, in the chute. And he had a big brass ring with a sharp point, had a hinge. And we took that ring and we, we stuck it through his nose. And we tied a chain to it. And so now, if we wanted to control that bull, all we had to do was take a stick or grab that chain and we could lead him around because he was sensitive and that thing would, we could, we could lead him around. I also saw that we had, we had neighbors that had these, they called them Chanina bulls. They're like a Charolais, but they're bigger. They're, they're like six foot tall at the shoulders. And they had the same thing. They just had a, a big ring in the nose. They would take a, a special handle and clip it onto that thing and they could, they could lead that huge bull around. Just a little, 150 pound guy could control that massive bull. And that is very similar, or it's an illustration, or it's a picture of what you look like when you allow yourself to be controlled by your sexual desires. It's like the devil can lead you around and do whatever he wants with you because he's got full control of you. You are not under the control of the Holy Spirit. You're not um, under God's control. You're under his control. You're a slave to your lusts. But it's not God's will that you be that. So let's read this passage, Genesis 34. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. 
And Shechem spake unto his father Hammer, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hammer the father of Shechem went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And Hammer communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get ye possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall ask, what ye shall say unto me, I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will according I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hammer his father deceitfully, and said, Because he had defiled Dinah their sister, and they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you, if ye will be as we, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughter unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then will we take our daughter, and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hammer and Shechem, Hammer's son. And the young man deferred not to do this thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. And Hammer and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us, therefore let us dwell in the land and trade therein. For the land, behold, it is large enough for them, etc. Let's go forward just a little bit. Um, at, in verse 24, and, un, and unto Hammer and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of the city. And every man was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hammer and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. And they took their sheep and their oxen, their asses, and that which was in the city and all that which was in the field. And all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and to Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me. And I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? There's a lot of different things we can say about this chapter. And a lot of conclusions or applications that could be made. The Bible is, is basically giving us the narrative. And Dinah was Jacob's only daughter. He had 12 sons, one daughter. And the first part here, it says she, she went out to see the daughters of the land. Um, which I can't necessarily take fault in that. I mean, she's the only girl in a house full of boys, and she wants to go out and, you know, find some other female companionship, I guess. And, and you know, girls need friends. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. And one thing I, I just I, I thought about, and that is that she was Leah's daughter. Leah, as you know, was Jacob's less favored wife. She was unloved. And so I don't know if this was the case, but it's possible that she was not close to her father because she's Leah's daughter. And so she might have felt a bit rejected by, by Jacob. I don't know. Again, the Bible doesn't say that she was or she wasn't. But we know that this happened. She goes out, and this prince um, sees her, takes her, and defiles her sexually. 
The other thing I notice here is that Jacob held his peace. He heard about it. He probably wasn't happy about it, but it says he held his peace. He did not do anything about it. And that, that part bothers me a bit, and I, I don't want to necessarily cast aspersions on Jacob's character. He was um, later Israel. He, is, he was a man of faith. I would just, I guess just a little footnote, just say that even men of faith have blind spots. Is, I mean, is that amen? Men of faith have blind spots sometimes, and they don't, they don't um, always take everything into consideration. And so he held his peace. He didn't do anything about it. He didn't deal with the situation. He didn't go out and say, hey, Shechem, what's going on here? What has happened? This is my daughter, and I love her, and you've defiled her. I'm going to hold you accountable for what you've done. Didn't do anything about it. Simeon and Levi were indignant. It says they were, they were wroth. They were angry. And just, just, just a point I want to make there. So, in their culture, obviously, it says they wrought. What, what is the verse here it says? Um, which thing ought not to be done, verse 7. Because he had wrought folly in Israel. Which thing ought not to be done. So it was, it was a grievous it was a grievous sin in their eyes. And you see, even in, in the way that Hammer and Shechem approached them, they knew that they had messed up, or Shechem knew that he had done something wrong, and Hammer was trying to appease Jacob and appease his sons because they knew they had messed up. So in their culture, they knew this was wrong. And... I don't know, did these, did these people have a, they, they, they likely had a knowledge of the one true God. They likely had a knowledge that Jacob was a follower of this one true God. They, I imagine they knew about Abraham and Isaac. And so they had some understanding. And they had some, a bit of moral compass. And they knew this was wrong, what had been done. And I want to just compare and contrast that with the culture that we live in today. The culture we live in today has lost that almost entirely. The culture we live in today excuses that and says, well, you know, boys will be boys, or well, you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. You know, we don't like it, but that's just kind of the way it goes. My daughter's going to go to college, and who knows what's going to happen. Or my daughter's going to go to high school, who knows what's going to happen? Anymore, it's like you don't even, nobody even raises an eyebrow. Well, it wasn't really that way 20 years ago, even in the culture. People cared more back then. 10 years ago, they probably cared a little more than do now. Now it's like nobody cares. And unfortunately, I feel like the same attitude has sort of gotten, it's worked its way in, into the church. And maybe it's even worked its way into our minds to where we don't hold this as important as much as we used to. And we're willing to kind of turn a blind eye or not be as concerned about the purity of our sons and daughters as we ought to be. So just making, making that, that point in passing, I think that it, we do well to, to think about it. How did we get here? Why is our mindset the way it is? Why is it not more, why don't we see sin more the way God sees it? Have we, have we um, allowed our, our standards or our convictions to be eroded by the culture that we live among? So we see the result of this sin. The sons of Jacob... Levi and Simeon, and Levi, as you know, was you know, the, the tribe of Levi became the, the tribe of the priests, 
Simeon was Jacob's second born, the second born son of Leah. The oldest was Reuben. So these are the second and the third boy who take it upon themselves to avenge. And first they come and they, they trick um, these people into being circumcised. It says, if you'll, you know, if you'll be like us, then we, you, know, you can marry our daughter and we'll, we'll just be one people. It'll be, uh, you know, it'll be great. They use deceit. And uh, we could make a little passing remark. Where did they learn that? That, of course, you know, we were all born with a sin nature, but their father Jacob was kind of a deceiver. And so I think maybe he was doing a little reaping here as well. But they went out there and they massacred all the men in that village. And so the result of that sin, the revenge that was brought, the bloodshed that was caused, all because of one sin. On the one hand, you see the passion that they had in making right a great wrong. They, they felt justified in, in taking these drastic measures. On the other hand, it was a terrible thing. Loss of life. Many, many lives lost. And so, I think it's good that we draw a parallel from that and we say, what is the result long term of sin? What is the result long term of compromise? What is the result long term of a girl losing, losing her purity and, and, and compromising in this way? Well, we don't know. We probably never can really measure that. But I guess I just want to emphasize in the minds of young men and young women here that the long-term result of one moment where you lose it, where you give way to sin in your life, where you give way to lust, where you take something that is not yours, where you sin against God, You'll never know what the end result of that is. You'll never know what the reaping of it will be. You'll never know the negative effects of it. We, don't, we can't quantify those things. And only, you know, only in eternity, maybe, will we ever know. But again, the effects and the results of that were terrible immeasurably terrible. Let's go to 2 Samuel 13. It's another, another example. And here I want to start emphasizing something especially to young men because Young men, I believe, it, when it comes to sexual sin, especially between a young man and a young, a young woman, a young man carries the majority of the responsibility. And we should carry it. Because, now I'll, I guess I'll, I'll just emphasize this, because men, and young men especially, the sexual urge of a man is a, is a powerful force. And... If a young man gets to the place where he becomes sexually aroused and, and is, has, has silenced his conscience to the point where he is okay with sinning, then he loses control of, there's, there's, there's actually a medical explanation for it. I'm not sure of all the, the terms, but um, the the part of your brain that is in control of your actions actually gets neutralized when you give in to sexual lust. And so that's why it's so easy for a man to fall into sin and later be like, how did I ever get there? Why did I do that? And bemoan the fact that he ended up there. And it's hard, for, I think it's hard sometimes for women to understand why that is the way it is, why it works that way, but it's the way God created men Unfortunately, men who don't learn or don't grow up as boys learning to control their appetites and their desires, they become uncontrollable and they, they become slaves to those desires. A young woman, on the other hand, is more controlled by, um, and this, this is what I understand and hear, 
but more, more controlled by emotion and um, being desirable or being desired. And I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said about it, but there's, there's more of a draw with that aspect of it, not so much the sexual desire, but the, the emotional aspect of it. And so let's read this, this passage in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Verse 1, And it came to pass after this that Absalom the son of David had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon the son of David loved her, and Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes in thy sight, in my sight, that I may eat at her hand. And then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress some meat. So Tamar went to her brother Ammon's house, and he was laid down, and she took flour and kneaded it, and made cakes in his sight, and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Ammon said, Have out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. And Ammon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber, that I may eat out of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made, and brought them into the chamber to Ammon her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her, and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. This is a terrible story. And again, a young man who saw something he wanted, thought that he wanted. It says that he loved her at first. He was intrigued, or he was, he was infatuated. And the deceit that was there, he thought that this would just be the greatest thing ever. He was obsessed with her. He was like, if I could only have her, then I would just be happy. And that's deceit. It's, it's deception. I want you to understand that as young people, if the devil puts something out in front of you and says, that's what you want to make you happy, understand that if it's sexual sin, you're being tricked. You're being lied to. You're being deceived. And not only, we can't just blame it all on the devil because James says that we're enticed by our own lusts. And so if you're, going, if you're in a place where you're vulnerable and you're being enticed, you're being drawn into a situation that you know is sin, you can trust one thing, and that is that you're being lied to. And ironically, in Amnon's case, it wasn't at all what he thought it would be. It says he hated her and sent her out and said, lock the door behind her. And you can hear the pain that he caused in her. And she's like, where am I going to go? How am I going to hide my shame? And she begged him, don't do this. But he forced her. He raped her. And she said, you're going to be... She spoke prophetically. 
In verse 12, no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. Thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now, young men, hear me clearly. And again, there's forgiveness. There's grace. There is mercy for all of us. But if you're considering it, if you're thinking about it, if you're enslaved, if this controls you, it'll make you a fool. It'll bring you low. It'll destroy you. If you have been destroyed, if you have been brought low, there's, there is grace, there is help, there is forgiveness. There's, there are so many resources available for you. It's like all you've got to do is talk and just say, this is the problem I have and I need some help. And there's help available for you. But if you're in this trap, get out of it. There is grace and forgiveness. There is help. There's freedom to be found. You can be restored. Yes, there's going to be regrets. There's going to be scars. But don't continue in folly. Amnon, if you read the rest of the sordid story, Tamar goes home. Absalom, her brother, finds out what happened. And again, David, asleep at the wheel. Sorry. He should have read the tea leaves. He should never have allowed his daughter to be put in that kind of a situation. And he doesn't do anything about it. He says he was grieved. He hated it. But I'm sure his mind went back to his own failure. And that's the, that's, that is the unfortunate result of sin, is that if we have committed it, later we don't feel like we can do anything about it what happens in the generations to come. It feels like, well, David probably felt like, what can I say? I failed so horribly with Bathsheba. What can I say in this situation? God's repaying me. He's bringing vengeance back on me. I'm sure that's what he was thinking. Later, when he was dealing with Absalom, you can see that. I'm reaping for my sin. But somewhere along the line, we've got to break these curses. We've got to stop. This has to stop. And somewhere along the line, we have to get a mentality in our families that just because my ancestors engaged in some stuff that was pretty shady, just because it was accepted in the culture that I grew up in, just because it was, you know, people turned a blind eye to it in the, in the environment that I grew up in, does not make it okay today. And can we reckon with that and just say, look, I'm not going to continue down this road. My generation is going to be different. I'm going to protect my daughters. I'm going to teach my sons. And we will not continue this road where daughters are vulnerable because somebody has messed with them and they don't feel worthy of a good husband. I'll just go back to what I said at the beginning. Satan is always looking to interfere with God's purposes. It's one of the main ways he does it. One of the main ways he does it. To get them to fall into sexual sin. Demoralize them. Make them vulnerable. They're wide open to further deception. To further attack. To further compromise. And on and on it goes. If we would look at God's purposes and his desires for our lives and say, you know what, Lord, I want to do it your way. I want to follow you. I know it's going to cost me.
because sexual sin at its very root is just self-centeredness. And if we have self-centeredness as a young person, we bring that into courtship, it'll continue in the courtship, it'll manifest in different ways. It'll manifest in compromise. It'll manifest in turning your relationship into something that is just a focus on the physical and the physical enjoyment you get out of it. And trust me, if in a courtship you're just focusing on that whenever you're together, that's about as high as you're going to rise. You're not going to be able to have good spiritual upbuilding conversations. You're not going to be able to get to know each other at a heart level because the focus is always on the physical when you're together. And that tension is always there and it's always about that. And come on, that's not a very good basis to build a marriage. Sexual intimacy is a great thing in marriage, and it has its place. But if that's all your focus is on in your courtship, man, that's a shallow basis to build a marriage on. And you're not going to rise above that if you're focusing on that. That's all you're going to be thinking about, basically. Or it's going to be a huge distraction at the very least. And guys, if, that's, if, that, if you're compromising and that's, and that's what you're interested in, you're a thief. I'm sorry. You're taking what's not yours. And you need to repent of it because it's not yours. That's why Paul says in Timothy, he says, treat the young girls as sisters. How do you treat your sister? Well, if it's a healthy family anyway, you treat her with respect. It's a very, very basic principle. That's how you treat a young girl that you're courting. You don't indulge in things that arouse your sexual desires. Flee youthful lusts. What are you doing when you indulge in things that arouse your sexual desires? You're sure not fleeing. You're disobedient. Sorry. I know. A lot of us are thinking back. Yeah, messed up. Shouldn't have ever gone there. Shouldn't have done that. I like the illustration that Paul Washer uses. He says, and this is talking about courtship. And by the way, a couple Sundays ago, I was talking with my, my brother in law, Eddie. And. <clears throat> Eddie has a little, little interesting story. He, um, he's my brother-in-law. He married my sister, Carmen. They were just here last Sunday or two Sundays ago. So my sister, Carmen, was in her late 20s. And she'd been doing BS quite a bit. And she was just really laid back, just easygoing. She's my easygoing sister. My sister, Evelina, she's a little more of a firecracker. Um, she gets things done. My dad, my dad, when after mom died, my dad would always say, you know, if he's having a bad day and feeling kind of low, he'd just go visit Carmen and she'd make him feel better. But if there was stuff in his life that he knew needed to happen, like he needed to get some better medication or needed to do something different, he'd go see Lena because she'd, she'd get him in line. <laughs> but anyway, so Carmen was getting a little bit older and she wasn't married. And my dad uh, saw a young man in the neighboring community, which was Eddie. And so dad's like, this is an option. And so she goes and talks to Eddie, says, hey, I've got a daughter. You know her. She needs a husband. Would you be interested? <laughs> and Eddie's like, yeah, matter of fact, he would be. And today they're married. And Eddie now says, that's the biblical way. Why are we doing it the way we're doing it? That's the biblical way. And we laugh, but he's got a point. Now, Paul Washer's example was, you know, in, in most cultures of the world, when a young girl gets married, marriageable, marriageable age, the father, who's maybe in his 40s and knows a lot more about young men and their character than his 19-year-old daughter, he goes out in the community and he finds a suitable young man, talks to her father, and they make an arrangement, and they get married. So in other words, the father brings this young man to his daughter and says, 
here's your new husband. But he says in our culture, a young girl goes out with very little knowledge of godly character or of good character in a young man and selects a young man who suits her fancy and brings him home, presents her to her father and says, Dad, here's my new husband. That's, you know, truncated version, but that's basically the way it's happening in our culture today. I'm not talking about in our culture. And the father, in the second scenario, the father has no choice. The first scenario, presumably, the girl has no choice, but we all know, you know, if the father loves his daughter, he's probably going to take her thoughts into consideration. My point is, as, a, as children of God, the ideal scenario, obviously, is that father and daughter have a good relationship and are able to communicate, communicate. And she's mature enough and she's prepared enough and she's understanding and, and just strong enough that she doesn't fall for the first charlatan that comes along and tries to sweep her off her feet. She takes her father's opinion into consideration. She goes to dad and says, hey, dad, I think this guy kind of likes me. What do you think of him? Or ideally, it doesn't even get that far, the young man comes to dad first and says, hey, I'm interested in your daughter. Would you be okay if I would try to initiate a relationship with her? That is the ideal. And guys, if you're interested in a girl, just keep that in mind. We dads like to be kept into consideration or taken into consideration because it's our daughter, for goodness sake, you know, that you're hoping to be her husband. And we would like to have some input. And their mom would too, obviously. And so that's the ideal. Anyway, where was I going with this? Headed down this road, not sure where to, where to conclude. But anyway, it's time to wrap this up. That, that is, yeah, I guess what I was just setting forth is that, is, that was the example Paul Washer gave. And that is, to me, a suitable alternative to arranged marriages, which obviously probably never, I mean, although Eddie is a strong proponent of somewhat that scenario, I don't know how, how, how popular it's going to become. But I, I do believe that as the people of God, as Christians, as people who want to, who just want the best for our, our, our families, our children, who want the kingdom of God to prosper, who want strong families in a world that is increasingly getting dark and degenerate and going to, yeah, going to hell. We want to have families and want to have churches which are made of families that are strong, that stand, that withstand the pressures of the world around us, that are able to do it God's way, that are able to teach our children to do it God's way, that are able to instill conviction in our children because it's the right thing and because it's for their blessing and because it's good. I want you to think about what Joseph did because I didn't give, all I gave you was negative examples from the Bible, but, and we're not going to go, we're not going to turn there, but I want you to think about what Joseph did. In the face of temptation, in Egypt, by himself, rejected of his family, had every reason to compromise, right? God doesn't care where I am. He's obviously allowed all this to happen. Here's an opportunity to sin with a beautiful young Egyptian woman who's obviously disconnected from her husband. I'll just go ahead and indulge myself here and have a little bit of an enjoyment. What does he do? It says she insisted day after day after day. He was a good-looking boy. And she wanted him. But he says, your husband, my master, has put everything in my care. There's nothing that he hasn't put under my authority except you because you are his wife. How can I sin against God and do this great evil? He says, no, I will not give in to my urges. He was in control of his sexual urges. He mastered his sexual desire. Apparently, he had a good relationship with his father and his father taught him a little bit. And he did not give in. He did not compromise. He did not fall. And that's the standard that we should hold. That's the target we should aim for. And I hope and I pray that everyone who hears it 
can aim that way. And if there's sin in your past and there's regrets in your past, confess them, get free of them, put them under the blood, renounce them, and go on. God is able. God is able to make beauty out of ashes. God is able to raise you up. God is able to help you rise above that, to go beyond it, and to fulfill the purpose that he has for you. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for all of us here. I know the enemy has so many of us in his crosshairs. And I know how weak we are at times. And Lord, if you will give us a vision and you will give us just a picture of what your purposes are and how we can rise above that which chains us and enslaves us, we're able by your grace and in your strength because of Jesus. Lord, just... I just pray that the lies of the enemy would be neutralized and truth would be exposed. Truth would shine forth and these lies would be exposed. We would see who we can be in you and how your purposes can be carried out. Lord, if there's somebody here who has been in the middle of failure or who is continuing, continuing in failure, God, I just pray that you would illuminate their minds. And don't let the enemy steal the seed that's planted. I pray that your word would do its work and your spirit would do its work in spite of the weakness of the, the speaker. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a song. Brother Felix for the message. Definitely very, very powerful. <clears throat> Sing number 503, Christian hymnal. 503.
I can say amen to the message. I was greatly blessed, encouraged. Uh, yeah, I think we heard a, a powerful message from God this morning. You know, just a lot of really solid, good biblical teaching. Just some really solid advice. And I just, I want to encourage you young men to take heed. Uh, it's like, it's like Felix shared over and over. He said there is, there is grace, there is forgiveness available, there is hope. And if you find yourself in that position, do something. Uh, yeah, don't, do not continue down that path. For the end of that path is destruction. So I've just been really, really encouraged. Uh, it's like Felix shared, you know, looking back, you know, yeah, a lot of, a lot of us older, we have regrets. There's, there's regrets in my life, I look back. But I know that those are, they're under the blood. I just, I want to encourage you, yeah, seek, seek God, seek his will for your life. I want to open it up if there's anyone who has a word of testimony. The time is yours. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else? I made a lot of mistakes in my life, and uh, I have three small daughters and a son. And I look around and all this is full of sexual sin and all this stuff. And I just I'm afraid. And I'm scared. And I really appreciate you guys this morning. I know it's hard to have some freedom in that. Thank you, David. You know, when we talk about sexual immorality, you know, I know Felix didn't refer to it, but, you know, we, we look at the subject of pornography that falls right into that, that same category. And if you're, if you're a young man and you're dealing with that and you're struggling with that and you're thinking about getting into a relationship with a girl, it's not going to bode you well uh, if, if that's where you find yourself. I just I want to plead with you to, if you know, find help. There's, there's like Felix shared. There's help available. Anyone else? All right. As far as announcements, we don't have a lot of announcements. Uh, tonight would be the night, the evening for a service here, and we we're planning on having a, uh, just having a hymn singing here this evening, and maybe also having a time of sharing. 
So if you have something to share, come prepared for that. But uh, yeah, uh, try to show up. If we have enough people here, we can have a, have a good hymn singing this evening. I always enjoy those. So uh, also, I believe this is the week for the fish fry. So be prepared for that as well. Are there any other announcements before we close? Plain your gym. Okay. Any more announcements? All right. Why don't we all stand and uh, let Brother Felix close? So. Now may, may mercy, now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Son and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Oh, yes. yes. Ah, let's pray for the food. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather and share food together. We just pray, God, that you bless the food and bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.